Thursday and full week again this week in the sanctoral. Today is the feast day of St. Agatha, who is one of the virgin martyrs who is memorialized in the Roman canon of the Mass. It's also the nativity of my brother, but we don't know if he's a saint yet. He's not dead, so he's still got time to mess things up, so we'll see. Uh, the sixth, we commemorate the Japanese martyrs, uh, the many that were killed under the uh, Japanese emperors. Uh, and the feast uh, of Jose Sanchez del Rio is on the 10th. He's a very pertinent saint for our day and place uh, because when the Masonic government of Mexico exiled or murdered so many, all of the priests and religious in Mexico, a group of the Mexicans who rebelled, they called themselves Cristeros, uh, fought against this. And Jose Sanchez was one of the teenage martyrs of this movement. He was turned in uh, and really executed by his own godfather. So be careful who you pick for that. Uh, and he uh, was tortured and died with the phrases of Viva Cristo Rey, Live Christ the King on his lips. And in our day, when our country gets so much more closer to that line, we need more Cristeros, young and old, who, like Jose Sanchez del Rio, proclaim. Viva Cristo Rey. Now we have a number of female saints this week that I want to talk about in a general way. We have St. Agatha who is tortured to death uh, for her faith in Christ. We have St. Josephine Baquita who was an African slave who uh, when had the opportunity converted and became a nun. St. Scholastica was a very holy woman, the sister of St. Benedict who with her brother and the orders that they founded. Uh, basically saved the church and Western civilization after the fall of Rome. And of course, our blessed lady, Mary, the mother of God, whom we honor this week uh, because of her apparitions in Lourdes, France. And in light of all this, I want to make the comment that we live in a world that is so confused about many things that humanity has generally understood since creation. And many of them center on sex and sexuality. And I'm not talking about things like homosexuality or all this, these innumerable genders, supposed genders. All of that is merely the fruit, the logical consequence of having denied more basic fundamental truths. Now, most people in the world still accept that men and women are different and what God's intention for sexuality is. But there's a large number of people in Europe and North America especially, most of whom are in government and are very vocal, uh, who live in a fantasy world where all of this is completely subjective uh, and that what God has established is distorted. And what does that have to do with our saints? Well, let me share with you the traditional collect of Saint Agatha. I'm not sharing this for my amusement, but I am amused at the response. O God, who among the other marvels of thy power has granted even to the weaker sex the victory of martyrdom, mercifully grant that we who celebrate the heavenly birthday of blessed Agatha, thy virgin and martyr, may by her example draw nearer to thee. I was told this afternoon by my godson that there was, he felt a collective gasp when I read that at the 9 a.m. Mass. Modern feminism, of course, of which even many modern men are not immune, uh, will not accept what this collect really means because they've worked tirelessly to remove this phrase weaker sex from our vocabulary. But there's two points here that are extremely important. The first is, is that it is a denial of reality to reject the fact that objectively speaking, as a group, women are physically weaker than men as a group. The emphasis on as a group, because there are certainly women who are physically stronger than many men. Many men are physically weak. Get to the gym, guys, okay? But I want to note particularly in this collect that it's recognizing that there is an objective difference between men and women, but at the same time affirming the spiritual strength of women and that they are not less than men because they're actually capable of enduring as much, if not more, than men. You can see that in the fact that some of them actually want more than one child. 
or give birth to a child, I should say, yes. So there's two points that we can reflect on in this reality. One is, is that strength is not merely physical, and one's importance is not measured merely by power. This is the grave error at the heart of the modern feminism when it's wrong. Listen to the account of how Agatha died as Father Butler shares it. So first of all, after she's accused, she appears before the judge, Quintianus. He gave orders for her being put into the hands of Aphrodisia, a most wicked woman, who with her six daughters, all prostitutes, kept a common stew. And this went on for a month, and Agatha resisted all of the evil there. And then Quintianus ordered her to be stretched on the rack, which torment was usually accompanied by stripes, that is whipping. The tearing of the sides with iron hooks and burning them with torches or matches. The governor, enraged to see her suffer all this with cheerfulness, commanded her breast to be tortured and afterward to be cut off. To which she replied, Cruel tyrant, do you not blush to torture this part of my body, you, you that suck the breasts of a woman yourself? So after she's taken back to the prison cell, she's, St. Peter appears to her, comforts her, heals her wounds. This doesn't in any way change the mind of the judge, so he goes even further, and he has her rolled naked over live coals mixed with broken pop charts. Being carried back to prison, she made this prayer. Lord, my creator, you have ever protected me from the cradle. You have taken from me the love of the world and given me patience to suffer. Receive now my soul. There's nothing weak about that. And that's the important point here. That is true faith. That is strength of character. Women are the pinnacle of creation. The greatest creature that exists, of course, is one woman in particular. Therefore, women need to be treated with respect. And I'm not going to add the usual caveat that some people do like when they've earned it or when they're not being by letter words, etc. Many com men commit a great evil when they are dominate and abuse uh, women, not only when they impose their greater physical strength, but even more so when they do not respect women, using them instead for their own satisfaction. They are helpmates and partners, not toys and slaves. Many men are proud of having won a woman, or many women, and then they don't care for them once they, quote, again, have them. They treat them as property which they purchased, not people uh, with feelings. And this is seen especially with men who are actually charming until the, ch the couple starts having children, and then the woman is treated like a nanny and a housekeeper if she's lucky. Men, if you fall into the trap, you need to get out of it because you need to treat your wife every day like you are trying to win her. If you don't, you will lose her, even if she never actually leaves. Now, this week also begins in the traditional calendar something called Septuagesima. I know I've, I've mentioned this before, but for those of you who have slept since then, Septuagesima in the traditional calendar is a mini season that the, the church has between the Sundays after Epiphany, before the beginning of Lent, to help us prepare. And the traditional calendar has a lot of these little transitions, which are very helpful to, to look at the nuances of what we should be celebrating as we go through the year. And as we approach then the great fast of Lent, I wanted to take a few moments, as I do every year on these three Sundays, to talk about the three practices of Lent, which is increased prayer, more almsgiving, greater physical mortification and fasting, so that you are not waking up on Ash Wednesday morning going, oh crap, I didn't decide what I'm going to give up, so you default to something just to say you've done something. So we want to put some thought into this to prepare. And so what I want to speak about today, and especially appropriate in light of uh, the reading from Isaiah, is almsgiving. But before I speak about almsgiving, I want to make a distinction. The tithe, that is the 10% of your income you give to the church, or the offering, because if it's not 10%, it's not really a tithe, 
is not the same thing as almsgiving. These are two distinct things. They're both duties, but they are different duties. The offering or the tithe is given for two principal purposes. One, as an act of thanksgiving and humble, uh, humble thanksgiving for what God has given and recognizing that it comes from Him and that it goes back to Him. And secondly, to actually keep the lights on and to pay for a priest and to actually have the things that we need to offer the Holy Sacrifice, the other sacraments, our classes, and everything else. So uh, those are, that's the offering and the tithe. That is a duty because uh, we are participating in that, we are receiving from it, and therefore we should give. But almsgiving is a different duty. This is giving to the poor. This is giving to those who are in need. Uh, money and material goods. Both of them are very necessary. But I want to make a point here before I say any more. It's also very subjective, which is why it's important that I occasionally talk about this and that you occasionally reflect on it. Because I can't just give you a simple answer. This is why I don't go around and say, you need to be giving 10% uh, more than you're giving, or you're, you need to give me 50 more dollars. I can't do that. I don't know your situation. Uh, and I certainly have enough things to keep track of. I'm not going to keep track of that. But you have to discern based off of these principles, what is it that you are giving to God, how much you can afford, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what I want to speak about today uh, is regardless of the amount, the order of charity. Uh, there's a common phrase you may have heard before, I'm sure many of you have, that says, charity begins at home. This is an idea that's formed from St. Paul to the Galatians and to Timothy. And so when you apply charity beginning at home in this area, then it shows us that the parish to which we belong, where we attend Mass, and local charities which help local people in need should be our priority. Also, even within our families, our immediate family receives our, the benefits of these things first, then our parents, and then outward from there. So there is an order to this, and again, it has to be discerned well. And when I say local charities, I mean those particularly that help with the corporal works of mercy. It's not just giving to a nonprofit organization, it needs to be feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, sheltering the homeless, visiting the imprisoned and the sick, etc., etc. Those are the actual, those are the real needs. Now, after the parish, a little bit further out, is the diocese. And in one way, the diocese is an, or the parish is an extension, a part of the diocese. It's the diocese here at St. Jude's. Uh, and so the same principle applies. However, from an offering standpoint, they're already getting an offering from you because the, the diocese taxes the parish from what you give. Therefore, they're already getting that offering. Well, they've never seemed to be satisfied. But on the almsgiving side, there are other things that, uh, special programs, for example, and these usually take the form of second collections, which go to real needs and which we should give generously to, but not as much as to the parish. And one of the forms of that is the bishop's annual appeal. Now, I know a lot of you have already received your envelopes. I'm not going to belabor the point today, but as part of your discernment in this, remember that next week we will be doing the whole in-pew thing where we hand out the envelopes and you fill out, if you have not done already, uh, what you are going to be giving. This is part of almsgiving because some of the things that this goes to are direct needs, direct charities like Catholic charities. Some of the other things that the Bishop's Appeal goes to are, the, of course, the seminarians. That's the largest chunk of that. We have 18 men in seminary. We will continue to have more Please God. And hopefully we'll continue to lose a lot of men to ordination. But uh, we also have to support the retired priests and also the St. Philip Institute, which teaches the faith. So these are all important. And so please factor that into your almsgiving. And thirdly, then, our almsgiving does and should uh, extend beyond the diocese. There are special collections that we take up for particular areas of the world that are in more need. And particularly, of course, closest to my heart would be the Good Friday collection, which goes to our persecuted brothers and sisters in the Holy Land. We should contribute well to these, 
but in order. These are the least important collections because the charity begins at home. So again, it does require a little planning, but consider these as you would as you reflect on uh, our duty, both in offering and in almsgiving. But for the sake of Lent, I just want to end with an emphasis on the almsgiving side. Uh, this is charity, again, given to the poor. Remember the words of our Lord at the end of St. Matthew's Gospel. Whatsoever you did or did not do to the least of my brethren, you did to me. The salvation or damnation of all of the people in this parable hinged on whether they fed the hungry, clothed the naked, etc., etc., etc. And so this Lent, as you are preparing to discern, or you're discerning what you are going to be offering up, then consider as part of your sacrifices things which involve spending money. Make the sacrifices, and then whatever you save from that, whatever it may be, for some people it's eating out, some people it's movies, uh, I don't know if you just collect guns, whatever it is, consider in these sacrifices what you are not going to be spending on, and then particularly and deliberately give that to St. Teresa Apostle. If you wish to receive mercy from God, then you have to show mercy. And one of the best ways that we can do that is by being merciful to the poor. 